Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. My name is Susan Oxtoby. I'm the senior film curator here at Banff PFA. Anne is giving me a moment of time. I just wanted to call your attention to um, uh, events happening uh, two weeks out from now. I, wanted, I realize this is an audience that probably really enjoys um, deepening their education through um, through cinema. And I wanted to mention that Bart Testa from the University of Toronto's Cinema Studies Institute will be our guest uh, related to the Bergman 100 series. Um, on March 9th and 10th, he'll be um, speaking before each of the films. And in fact, our second installment of the Bergman 100 deals with the issue of the silence of God in Bergman's cinema. Bart Testa will tackle that uh, topic in a keynote lecture, so really a lecture of 50 minutes length on Friday, March 9th at 7 p.m. And then after his lecture, we'll present Winter Light, which is the second film in the so-called God Trilogy, beginning with Through a Glass Darkly, Winter Light, and then The Silence. And Bart Testa will also introduce The Silence with a shorter introduction on Saturday, March 10th. He, um, he was a very important uh, teacher in my life. I studied at the University of Toronto in the early 80s, and I really do credit Bart for really opening my mind in, in terms of a lot of issues around film history, theory, criticism. And he's somebody who really loves developing lectures and new uh, areas of teaching. So he's, he's a generalist, um, but with specialties in avant-garde film, science fiction film, urbanism and film, Chinese cinema, etc. Uh, Bergman was a topic that he dealt with early in his career, and <laughs> he kind of chuckled when I invited him to come, because uh, he feels like he's going back to ancient history. But in any case, um, uh, this also gives me uh, the chance to once again thank Anne Nesbitt, somebody who's very dedicated to uh, teaching and has very kindly worked with Van PFA on this semester-long Eisenstein and his contemporary series. Um, and it, we really do thank you enjoying all of your lectures and all of what you're putting into this in addition to your uh, undergraduate course on Eisenstein and Nesbitt. Thank you. And thank you so much to Susan Oxby and the PFA for um, taking a risk on all these uh, strange Soviet films. Um, it's lovely to see them on the large screen. So yay, we're just so lucky to live in a place that has an archive like this, right? All right, so today we get finally to Eisenstein's version of the revolution. Um, so first I thought today, unlike usually, I would just um, start with the very basic basics, which is the plot of the film. What is the plot of the film? All you need to know are the names of five months. February, April, July, September, October. Right? Uh, of course, there is a little um, footnote caveat here, which is that, as mentioned before, the Russians didn't get around to switching from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar until February 1918, when they just dropped two weeks to catch up. Um, so many of the events described here and described in the film as belonging to one of these months really happened, really, it's all relative, happened two weeks later and probably in a different month. All right, so February. So first of all, we have the February Revolution of 1917, which really happened in March. Um, after a disastrous stint of fighting in World War I, mass uprisings lead to the abdication of the Tsar. Suddenly, there are two sort of governments jockeying for position. There's what's called the provisional government, um, dominated by the not-so-radical parties like the cadets. And even in the name of that provisional government, you see that they felt that they were actually sort of um, placeholding until, you know, democracy could figure out what it wanted to do. And um, another government run uh, a sort of s a shadow to the first, the Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, which was the radical um, side of things. So Soviet just means council. So it's like the Revolutionary Council. Alexander Kerensky, a big anti-hero in this movie, um, is the one socialist, so the one member of the Soviet, who's also in the provisional government. So he's the one sort of straddling those two uh, forces. Okay, so that's February. And, and 
what happens right after February. Okay, then we get to April. April. So now we have Lenin, who had been living in exile in Switzerland, um, coming back to Petrograd. Petrograd, remember, is the wartime name of St. Petersburg. Uh, he had crossed Germany in a sealed train with, notoriously, German support. Um, he was welcomed at the Finland station in Petrograd by Bolshevik supporters, but not just by them, also um, general members of the Petrograd Soviet and members of the provisional government. In speeches, which come to be known as his April Theses because April, right, denounces the provisional government and calls for dictatorship of the proletariat through the Soviet. The provisional government, meanwhile, is getting itself into trouble through ongoing wishy-washiness about what the role should be in the post-February Russia with respect to the war. Um, the war was super unpopular. I mean, it was partly that that led to the February Revolution in the first place. In June, the Russian army undertakes an offensive against the Germans and the Austrians, and it goes well for a few days, but then by July, it becomes a disaster. So now we're on July, known as the July Days. Bolsheviks call for protests to support their demands on the provisional government. The crowds clash with Cossack troops supporting the provisional government. And after this clash, everybody in the provisional government and even a lot of people in the Soviet are very concerned about the Bolsheviks. The provisional government publishes documents a lot of this actually has resonance with things going on um, not that long ago here. It's sort of interesting. Okay, the provisional government publishes documents suggesting that Lenin and Trotsky and other Bolsheviks were agents funded by Germany. Uh, and the provisional government sent officers to smash the offices of Pravda and to arrest Lenin, but Lenin had already slipped um, out of Petrograd and went into hiding in Finland. We get to see that. Uh, public opinion at that point was sort of going against the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were put on trial in Petrograd, and we get little glimpses of this. Following the July days, Alexander Kerensky, our anti-hero in this film, becomes prime minister of the provi provisional government, and he makes General Kornilov commander-in-chief of the Russian armies. And this turns out to be a serious error in judgment, taking us toward September. Kerensky hopes to use General Kornilov against the Soviets, but Kornilov wants the power himself. Okay, so here we are in September. So this is when the struggle between Kerensky and General Kornilov comes to a head. Kerensky orders Kornilov to hand over his command. Kornilov says, no way, and orders his armies to march on Petrograd. The Soviet enters the fray by organizing a military committee for the defense of Petrograd. Many Bolsheviks are still in prison, Lenin's still in exile in Finland, but Bolsheviks in Petrograd are energized and thousands of Red Guards prepare to defend Petrograd against Kornilov. But Kornilov's approach and that of his special division of soldiers from the Caucasus called the Savage Division and depicted it here, um, is blocked by railway workers and revolutionaries. And on September 13th, he's, Kornilov is arrested, Kerensky, this is his uh, walk up the stairs, you know. He was making himself now commander in chief and prime minister. Now we get to October. Lenin returns in disguise to Petrograd. At a meeting of the Bolshevik Central Committee, he argues for revolution. Trotsky supports him. And although some others on the committee are against it, Lenin's call for revolution passes. On the night of November 6th, which is 24th October, in the old style, the Bolsheviks take over the telegraph offices and the sa railway stations. Delegates are coming to the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets at this same time. Um, at 3.30 a.m., Trotsky gives a speech at the All-Russian Congress of Soviets saying, the insurrection is in progress. Um, on the 25th of October, the next day, Trotsky declares they've taken power from the provisional government. Kerensky borrows a car from the American embassy and flees. Don't worry too much about him. He ended up having sort of university gigs all across the United States, including like uh, University of Colorado Boulder. So it wasn't too bad. Inside the Winter Palace, Kerensky's ministers hide out wondering what they should do. It's defended only by 
the Women's Brigade and students from some military academies. A blank shot is fired at the palace from the Aurora. A couple of windows are broken. That's it. The Bolsheviks walk in. The Winter Palace has fallen. The provisional government is under arrest. So that's the plot of October, a film whose mission was to improve on history as much as possible, right? Make that revolution much more dramatic than it had been, and also in specific. This was part of the film's assignment to include, quote, the image of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, leader of the Socialist Revolution, founder of the Soviet state, unquote. So now this was actually a challenge that was sort of dicey. The news that an actor would be for the first time attempting to play Lenin in a film. Actually, they found a lookalike guy from some obscure town. All footnotes like disagree even as to where he came from. He was so obscure. They found him, they brought him up, and they put him in two movies, um, Eisenstein's October and Barnett's uh, Moscow in October. And this provoked a certain amount of scandal. The poet Mayakovsky, not someone known for calm approaches to things, but usually on good terms with Eisenstein, uh, made his outrage public. Uh, already in October 1927, he railed against the use of Vasily Nikolaevich and Nikondrov as a quote unquote Lenin. He said, our Soviet cinema in the person of Eisenstein is gonna show us a counterfeit Lenin, some sort of Nikandorov or Nikandrov. I promise that at the most solemn moment, Wherever it may be, I will whistle. I will throw rotten eggs at this counterfeit Lenin. This is an outrage. Now, if you think about it just for a moment, you can see how perilous that approach might be, right? When you throw your rotten eggs at the counterfeit Lenin, how is someone supposed to know whether you're throwing them at the counterfeit Lenin or at the real Lenin, right? And this is the problem all through with this film that tension between real things um, and their images. Um, yes, oh yeah, so here's, here's another playwright responding, because they like to fight the polemics going back and forth. So here's someone arguing back against Mayakovsky. Lenin is higher than any image an actor could create. But if you approach the matter from that point of view, it quickly becomes necessary to throw rotten eggs at all the portraits and photographs of Lenin, necessary also to bespatter all the works of art with Lenin in them, for that matter, also the poems of Mayakovsky himself. Okay. Uh, and Mayakovsky responds, uh, you, you just go on for pole polemics forever and never stop being interested, but it's, he says, it's disgusting to see a person take poses similar to those of Lenin and to make similar body movements and behind all this externality one feels a total emptiness, the complete absence of thought. The comrade was absolutely correct who said that Nikandrov is not similar to Lenin but to all of Lenin's statues. Uh, we want to see on the screen, not an actor's performance on the Lenin theme, but Lenin himself who even if only for a few frames would look at us from the cinema screen. So poor Nikandrov, imagine, was under a certain amount of pressure, as of course was Eisenstein, but Nikandrov uh, is our um, innocent victim almost in this. So he tried really hard to live up to his great role. Uh, he apparently buried himself in the reading of Lenin's works, and then he went to visit Lenin's wife and sister to learn quote unquote, what Ilyich, what Lenin was like in everyday life, en famille, et cetera. And of course, what's funny is this sort of Stanislavskian preparation for the role was completely out of proportion with what he was actually asked to do in the film, which was to stand like a statue and kind of wave his arm. Uh, so this was a problem for um, Eisenstein, the, the dangerous possible emptiness of the character of Lenin because did you really want to suggest that there was such a thing as a Lenin type? Eisenstein was famous for um, casting by means of what he called typage, typage um, in, in which he would take the outer look of somebody and say, oh, you look, this is a peasant type. Here is a revolutionary type. Could you have a Lenin type? 
that seems problematic. Is sheer physiognomy enough to um, guarantee some kind of deeper identity? But the most problematic character in October, as things turned out, would not so much be the Lenin who wasn't the real Lenin, but the Trotsky who was too much the real Trotsky. So let's talk about Trotsky for a second. He had still been in New York City during the February Revolution, but he got back to Russia in May, became chairman of the Petrograd Soviet, led the Bolshevik coup against the prov provisional government, what we call the October Revolution, and then led the Red Army during the Civil War. However, this film was not made in 1919. It was made in 1927. And by 27, Trotsky, who resisted Stalin's assumption of all power, um, was awkwardly in disfavor and on the slippery slope into even worse. However, Trotskyite signs appeared in some of the parades so celebrating the 10th anniversary of the revolution, November 7th, 1927, which was the day October was supposed to be shown for the first time. Now, Grisha Alexandra, who was uh, Eisenstein's co-director and a totally um, unreliable source of information but likes a good anecdote. So he claims that Stalin came by in person to see what Eisenstein and Alexander were up to in the editing booth as they desperately tried to make the uh, revolutionary anniversary deadline. And that Stalin asked them then, is Trotsky in your film? Um, then he was shown that Yes, in fact, Trotsky was in the film because it was about the revolution um, and responded, a picture with Trotsky in it cannot possibly be shown today. So according to Alexandra, this is why Eisenstein had to take the film back and work on it for a few more months before it was shown in um, early 1928. But one suspects that there were other things going on, the usual slowdowns and so forth. In the history of Eisenstein's theoretical evolution, October is all about developing a new kind of cinema, what he called intellectual montage, intellectual cinema. As he described the cinematic situation in 1929, only intellectual cinema will be able to put an end to the conflict between the language of logic and the language of images on the basis of the language of the cinema dialectic. In other words, it was going to heal the wounds described in Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. In a letter to a French film historian, um, Eisenstein points to two examples from October, uh, which become, not only for Eisenstein, but for his many readers and critics, the first portents of this new intellectual cinema of the future that will be able to just get all sorts of abstract ideas across. In other words, um, one of the projects he had after this was he wanted to make a film of Marx's capital. Yeah, right? Wow. I mean, it could be great. It could be great. All right, so here are the examples that we can look for and see whether they seem to us like a new form of intellectual cinema. One is Kerensky's extended ascent of a flight of stairs in the Winter Palace. He's shown ascending the same flight of stairs over and over and over again, and thus we are informed that he is ambitious, that he likes palaces, and that he's destined to get nowhere in the long run, right? Another sequence that Eisenstein points to is what's known as the gods sequence, in which the deity, as he would claim anyway, is reduced to a block of wood. You start with a Baroque Christ, and you sort of work your way through a series of images of gods, ending with a simple wooden idol. Eisenstein explains what he's up to this way. Um, to, I wanted to attack the very concept of deity by revealing its hollowness. To do this, I search for the most accurate expression of the idea about the splendor of the external aspect and the emptiness of its content. The required image came of itself. It lay in the equation of the most, most richly gilded Baroque Christ and a crude wooden idol of the Eskimos or Gilyaks. So what he wants to do to God is exactly what Mayakovsky accuses him of doing to Lenin to provide an essentially hollow image and thus allow a deadly emptiness to overtake the sacred figure. I'm just going here, because actually I do have a couple little pictures to show you. Um, 
The film is going to draw lots of comparisons throughout itself uh, between real people and statues. The statues are set up as like old ideals, old icons. We have Napoleon, we have the young lovers of Rodin kissing forever. We have a model of young motherhood watching its offspring take its first steps. Um, when the ugly, rumpled women soldiers of the Tsar's Death's Head Battalion, I, the smooth coolness of these marble images of women, they are meant to be entirely unmanned. Their rifles drop, he had read for it. Uh, they become wistful for the ideal from which they are separated by what seems a huge gulf indeed. And Eisenstein is laughing at both of the elements there. He's laughing at the women soldiers for being so unlike the statues that surround them, and he's laughing at the statues for being so irrelevant to all the things that matter in 1917. Like God, the statues are hollow and subject to deconstruction, as in the literal unbuilding of the statue of Alexander III with which the film opens. And here's a little show and tell about that opening sequence. So one thing that's sort of interesting about that is that the statue of Alexander III that is set up to represent the February Revolution in the film was actually not in uh, Petrograd at all. It was in Moscow. It was in front of the Church of Christ the Savior, which is sort of looming up there in the background. And you can see a kind of uh, silhouette of the church in the images. And it wasn't taken down until February, oh no, it's the summer of 1918. So this is not a historical moment. It's um, Eisenstein using the statue's disassembly uh, symbolically. Why? I mean, why would he choose this? Why would he choose a Moscow statue um, you know, that was taken apart at a different time? Because it was one of the most carefully documented statue lives ever. <laughs> it had only gone up in 1912. Here's the unveiling at that time, so not that long before. By 1918, uh, they decided they would take it down, and they did so documenting, so there's a postcard from its brief moment of being just a statue. Okay, and then these are photographs from the um, deconstruction of the statue, and they took so many photographs, which Eisenstein knew, that they sort of suggest almost a kind of stop motion animation of the deconstruction itself. So here we'll just go through them. They took off the head, they sent the head down a ramp, they came down to the bottom, you know, it was like, hmm. Eisenstein says later that he kept dreaming of putting a guillotine on the empty platform that the statue had been on, but that too is a sort of um, nod back to these images in which the statue is decapitated uh, revolutionarily. And then this beautiful image, just love it, of little kids um, admiring the statue. Because it's Eisenstein, so he, he takes this and he's sort of inspired by it and you'll see that he not only reconstructs the statue in order to take it apart, but then he runs a reverse stop motion to get the statue to come back together at a moment in the film when he wants to say, the revolution is in danger. Everything we took apart in February may be coming back together. But it was inspired by these um, pictures that existed. Okay, it was also inspired by his knowledge of Auguste Choisy's history of architecture. Okay, this is Eisenstein. He always goes to five million sources. We won't belabor the point, but this is a colossus at El um, Verset. And um, Eisenstein loved this image, and you can see that it's a seated colossus, which actually looks a little bit like, um, like Alexander III's statue. And what you see on either end are these ropes that go off, and actually the image um, was of many, many people pulling on the colossus to get it to where it was going to be set up. So Eisenstein sort of remembers this and runs it backwards. There's a certain amount of reverse motion here, symbolic and real, but uh, runs it backwards by having all these ropes taking down the seated colossus that in Choisy's book is being installed. And one other thing about this, which is that um, you can see here, this is an image from a film that we watched together uh, long, long ago, uh, The Adventures of Mr. West in the Land of the Bolsheviks. And um, in that film, you can see the, church, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in many 
background shots. And, and in fact, they go zipping by the front of the church where you can see the empty um, platform that the statue had been sit seating, se seated on before it was taken down in 1918. Um, this is a picture, a great picture, of Eisenstein's group um, and their pretend statue in pieces. So this is from the filming. You can tell because there are all those cameras lined up, right, up there. And you can see the sort of massive fake leg of the statue. And then behind it, and this t t um, tips you off in case the cameras hadn't already, you can see um, the head of the Tsar, but it's out of proportion with the leg and is actually much smaller than the head of the actual um, statue. OK. Um, yeah, OK, yes, yes, yes. Oh, and I just have to talk a little bit more about blasphemy in this film um, and the dirty jokes. OK, so another way to take down the czars is to remind us that they have bodies. And this is an important part of the film. The marauding soldiers take great pleasure in discovering the bathroom fixtures, which prove that the Tsar and Serena were also creatures of the flesh, like anyone else, with bowels that needed moving. And even Christ, um, by the magic of montage, uh, is made to lust in a very fleshly manner after a semi-naked statue. Uh, it's set up so that his gaze is squarely on her crotch. So what is October up to? One of the things that it's up to is a kind of destruction of the museum. In this case, the Hermitage, because the museum was also the palace, was also the museum. Um, throughout October, the precious objects of the museum are taken down, examined, and then used against their original purposes, used ironically. So the statues of Napoleon obviously never expected their fate would be to ridicule the very idea of imperial ambition. And there are a lot of other dirty jokes here as well. Kerensky's entrance into the anus of the fancy bejeweled pheasant, or no, peacock really, um, whose turning back is intercut with scenes of the door through which Kerensky must pass, and also elegant enameled eggs whose appearance functions as a comment on the Tsar's testicles. Viktor Shklovsky, formalist film critic, ironically said about October, Eisenstein's film is the first rational use of the Winter Palace. He has destroyed it. But um, the museum is a problem for post-revolutionary culture. How does one prevent these unreliable, fickle images of the past from infecting the present? Uh, Stolfsky's claim that Eisenstein in October has undertaken the destruction of the museum may be optimistic, as the film we saw last week end of St. Petersburg sort of implies because there the architecture still is, right? Lingering on, still able to weigh people down even in 1927. Um, let's see, yes, October, the film, is itself a kind of museum, a very long, extremely linear museum, one whose curator, whatever he may know about the inherent perilousness of such things, has been seduced by the objects and images under his care. They're you know, presented to us with cautions. There are even educational displays tucked into this museum, such as the sequence, proletariat, learn how to use a rifle, where a rifle assembles itself uh, educationally step by step. But as in any museum, the frames are never perfectly safe and secure. It's never entirely certain that a little idol, look at the way they're filmed, that a little idol may not retain at least as much power in some sense, as the Baroque god it's supposed to be supplanting and under, undercutting. Um, and it's also a bit of a problem when you look at the Lenin and wonder whether he is or is not a fake. There's a great moment where Lenin comes in in disguise and that he um, is seen, that his disguise is seen through and he says, they've spotted me, the bastards, which is a real place where the anxiety of the actor playing this Lenin and Eisenstein having an actor play Lenin and everybody's anxieties all get kind of wrapped up into the uh, film. The museum palace itself also suffers from the uncertainties of its architecture, hardly populated at all, 
giving no resistance adequate to warrant the throngs of thousands which Eisenstein, correcting history, shows fiercely fighting to conquer it, the Winter Palace is itself too much a hollow egg for comfort. And Eisenstein's obscene anthropomorphization of the palace, it's not just the peacock that gets an anus, but also the room into which Kerensky enters, and that kind of reveals the nature of the, of the place to us uh, in Eisenstein's perspective. The Winter Palace is at its heart a bit of a slut. Like the objects it contains, it gives itself over to new uses almost too easily, too loosely. Why should we trust it now? So I want to thank uh, Judith. Yay, Judith Rosenberg. She is going to provide us with the appropriate museum-destroying music for October, and I hope we all enjoy the revolutionary show. So I forgot to remind us, but we do, as usual, have our um, discussion moment here, in case you saw anything odd. <laughs> uh, one thing that I forgot to t remind you of was that the first and middle names of Kerensky and the Empress are the same. And so they're riffing on that as they have Kerensky sort of occupying the sort of Empress's old rooms and so on. Anyway, Judith was heroic, and she's under the weather, so let's give her a real revolutionary send-off. So as, um, as ever, I think there are microphones somewhere. Yes, there they are. So who would like to start us off? Okay. I have a question. Hi, Hi Professor. Um, so I was wondering, I saw that Eisenstein had a co-director. Yeah. Do you know anything about how they split up the directorial duties um, in both in pre-production and also on set? Do you know anything about how their relationship worked out? Yeah, so they had, um, so uh, Grisha Alexandrov did a lot of the directing here. Um, they had all these huge crowd scenes to wrangle. So um, they would often ha be both working at the same time doing different parts of the shots. One thing that um, Grisha Alexandrov writes about in his memoirs is um, well, during this, the summer parts of the story where you have uh, all those scenes of um, demonstrations marching with the banners saying all power to the Soviets and so on like this. Okay, so what they did for that is they co-opted a May Day, the actual May Day parades in um, 1927, and they handed around these old banners to some of the May Day parade people um, to carry. And you can tell that they're old, out of date, because they're saying things that you would not exactly be saying in 1927, and that orthography is still the old orthography uh, before they simplified the spelling. So. Um, this was actually an awkward moment uh, because you had suddenly a demonstration with these February Revolution era banners uh, marching along the boat at the um, bridges and so on. And so in Alexandrov's version, the police came and tried to arrest them for having um, a kind of anti-Bolshevik uh, march or not, you know, anti Bolsheviks as of 1927 March, and they had to like, rang, they had to talk their way out of trouble. He liked that kind of story though, so he tells a lot of those sort of stories. I'm not sure how literally you take them. That one, I, I suspect that they did have, they did puzzle some people with it when they suddenly were doing these like 1917 era marching. And it's an odd echo with what happens in the, um, in the anniversary of the revolution marches in November of 1927, when some banners came out in support of, the, of Trotsky and were put down. All right, more. Right here. So 
Is that one there? I uh, uh, wanted to ask, did he ever get in trouble for um, Eisenstein for eroticizing certain moments that otherwise shouldn't be? Um, for instance, the young youth's death on the steps by the water by Parasol? Oh, yeah, right. So it's Eisenstein, so there's always going to be um, so er oddly erotic moments and, um, and dirty jokes and violence that is eroticized and perhaps never more so than when the Bolshevik is stabbed to death by the vicious parasols of the bourgeoisie. Eisenstein admits that that didn't actually happen in the revolution, but he was thinking back, um, the imagery that was sort of coming to mind was stuff that he'd gotten out of the, Par the story of the Paris Commune uh, in 1771, 1870-71, that we sort of we saw not that long ago in New Babylon, and um, and uh, da, da, da. yeah. So, oh well, in a way, yes. I mean, so, but you know, the problem he he was always like skittering. So so as we see, he's going to get into trouble more and more as we go through his career. So in the 30s and in the 40s. Um, and often that's because he puts too much in any film. He always puts too much. And part of the too much that Eisenstein can't help putting in are these um, erotic moments where you, maybe they shouldn't be and so on and so forth. And so when you get into the films that are supposed to be glorifying Stalin, through historical um, substitutes like Nevsky and Ivan, then it becomes a little bit touchier how that all plays out. But yeah, so he's always he's always doing too much. He's putting too much in any of his films, and if you squint the right way, then you could see them as being quite scandalous, right? But then remember that at the time people did not have the advantage of watching these on video or DVD, so it sort of goes by and you're like, whoa, what was that? Um, and you don't get necessarily all of the, the questionable jokes that Eisenstein has stuffed in on your first viewing. That probably helped him. But it was okay to make fun of the provisional government and so on. So that he's doing that here in this, you know, wildly misogynistic uh, section about the women fighting, not fighting. And there was someone here. Oh. Do you know anything about how long of a shooting schedule he had for a movie like this or Battleship Potomkin? I remember watching Ivan the Terrible a few weeks ago and I think both part one and part two took a while to both film and maybe to edit. Yeah. But with a movie like this, my God, all those enormous crowd scenes, yeah. it would seem that something like this would take months and months, or did it take like uh, six weeks? Yeah, no, um, it took, well, I don't remember exactly how many weeks it took, but they did the filming um, in pretty much a rush in 1927. At that point, he was already working on a film that we're gonna see soon, The General Line, and he was taken off that, his agricultural film, to come and do this um, revolutionary anniversary film. So it was on a pretty tight schedule because they wanted to get it done by the anniversary of the revolution, which didn't happen in the case of Eisenstein's film. Podovkin made it, Eisenstein didn't. His didn't come out till March of uh, 28. Yes. Am I on? Uh, two questions. The images of the Buddhists, what did they represent? Okay. And second question, the American flag on the car, what was, was the American embassy involved some way? Or? Right, there, so this is the like American embassy providing the car to rescue Kerensky. And then where does he go? Boulder, right? Um, uh, yeah. So that's, so, and the flag is, is again, this sort of, um, it looks almost like they borrowed it from the Kuleshov film, Adventures of Mr. West. It's a slightly dubious looking version of the American flag, but that's what it's representing. And the Kerensky fleeing to his friends in the West. 
Um, and then... Um, the Buddhist? Oh, yeah. So that's part of this deconstruction of God. So notice how he does it. He starts, he creates this sort of ladder, this kind of ha hierarchy of images of God and kind of works his way down the ladder. Now, uh, so he starts with like the, this Baroque Christ in glory and then he kind of brings in representatives of all sorts of different religions and then he goes down and he's you know working with the museum offerings at this point bringing in all of these different idols from various traditions okay so ostensibly what he's doing is downgrading you know you're like you, oh i thought i believed in god and i thought that meant um you know the glorious god of of baroque christianity oops that's the same thing as all these other images of god including this little wooden idol, I guess I'm an atheist after all. We're all supposed to be atheists immediately after we see that sequence. It's supposed to be that effective. And it was Berkeley, so we didn't have far to go, maybe. <laughs> but, um, but you notice that there's something, of course, uh, we would say highly questionable about the whole idea of having this hierarchy where you go down and say, oh, well, that's like the most advanced version of God image, and then we have the slightly less advanced God image, and then we'll go down. This will be, and the funny thing is that Eisenstein himself doesn't actually feel this, and you can tell that already in this film. Even though ostensibly on the surface the film is saying um, we're destroying God by making God uh, re making us realize that God is really no more than the kind of God you see in this wooden idol here, but from the way it's filmed, actually, those simple idols have an incredible amount of force, I think. I mean, they're, they're, they're powerful images, actually. So, and this is something he, after this film, at the end of the 20s, he goes abroad, he ends up spending a year in Mexico, we'll be talking about that, making this film about Mexico, and reading all of these cultural anthropologists. And he turns around his official thinking at that point and says, you know what? I should have seen it all along because he's already doing it in October, even though he's not claiming to be doing it. He says, the really powerful images are things that come from uh, far from the past and from these things that we call primitive. That actually is where the power lies. And we should be bringing those up and using that power to further our modern Soviet um, ways of thinking. And this, that way of thinking did get him in trouble in the 30s. That was highly unpopular. We'll be talking about that. But you can see that he's already sort of acting and thinking in that way even before officially he starts talking about it. I have another question, and this one's kind of a two-parter. Um, did he always plan on the film not having a uh, like a main protagonist? Because mm -hmm. um, it's it is very collective and very much like lots of shots. In fact, I feel like he almost got so sidetracked with the statues that he forgot about maybe like a human element in a sense. Um, and if was it planned? And then if if it was when it came out, was there a criticism about? that because compared to like the Pudokin right? film from last week, um, the end of St. Petersburg, you know, that was very clearly we had like a peasant that we could follow through the film and yep. all those things. Yeah, so Pudokin's approach and Eisenstein's approach, very different in that respect. In Pudokin, you get, you get something to follow through the film, although those, you know, real people come and go. So there are whole sections of that film where uh, you sort of lose sight of what's going on with our guy from the countryside and his extended family, but they come back. The mother comes back at the end, and so does he. Uh, Eisenstein doesn't do that. We don't, we don't follow a particular person through the story as a way of sort of measuring what that story means. And yet, he uses the idea of giving us something to measure the significance of things by 
uh, in sections such as, for instance, the bridge, when the bridge opens, right? So there we get this moment where the horse, God rest its soul, right? And, and, the, and the woman with the long hair, right? They help, what they're there to do is to help us measure the gravity, literally, of events, right? So you have that horse, and it's like, what does it mean to have the bridges open and to have this sort of devastation? Oh, well, let's have, let's have a horse, you know, explain to us how high it is, how far it is to fall, what death means, you know, or her hair. You feel it in your scalp, I think, when you see that moment where the bridge is opening and that woman's hair is on ha part of the bridge and her head and body are going down the other side, right? So in a way, that's like a miniature version of what Pudovkin is doing in his film by having you have characters that you can follow through. Eisenstein will have you follow uh, a brief figure for a, for a moment. I mean, there's also the fact that we had to take Trotsky you know, out <laughs> or tone him down, um, not, not refer to him explicitly that makes it harder to kind of follow the narrative thread. Yeah. So Kerensky becomes our anti-hero. He's the closest thing we have to a uh, so figure that we can follow the way through. Given the context of the working conditions that they were making this film under, where a lot was made really incredible and a lot was rushed, and not able to complete. Um, a lot of it seemed like some of the most progressive things I've seen from the silent era, and a lot of it seemed like uh, Eisenstein was asleep at the wheel. Do you know if there was a hierarchy of what he knew he had to absolutely, no matter what, had to make good, like the bridge, or anything with guns and bullets and badges, he had to make look really good? And uh, if there's a hierarchy for other things where you're like, ah, I, I could just ignore that, it doesn't matter. All right. So, ironically, the parts of the film that are the most politically important for him to do a good job on is sort of where I think we modern people feel it sagging, and that would be the revolution. <laughs> All right. So the end, the October Revolution, oh my goodness, do we have to spend 20 minutes waiting for the response to come back, right? We're not sure that we actually do. Um, but that's, that's got to be yeah, sort of like the part of the, that's an important part of the story for him. He, he wants to make the most of his access to the Winter Palace and access to cast of thousands to throw at the Winter Palace and so on. And so he just, you know, seems to me that section just gets dragged out and out and out, whereas the first um, half or so of the film actually goes along in a pretty, you know, tidy way. It, it has a certain amount of momentum. I think that's a little bit like Battleship Potemkin, where um, also the last third has this sort of sagging, you know, where we're supposed to get extremely excited about the, whether the fleet is going to let us through or not and we take a long time building up to that. So in both of those films, he tries to build up tension by delaying something. But let's also remember the context of, the, of viewing these films, all right? Which is that um, it's a more exciting subject for the people watching it in 1928 than it might be for us. I mean, so when we're delaying something, we're delaying something that we're really excited about seeing happen in a way that um, we may not be quite as excited about. Plus, we've all read, we would have all read, of stories about how the revolutionary um, factions hold up in the former girls' school, which is what Smolny was, uh, where they're all, and so a lot of that is like, oh yeah, oh look at that, oh yeah, and there are those guys, right? Oh, Mensheviks, I remember hearing about them, <laughs> and so on and so on and so forth, which is something that we can't, you know, we can't watch it that way now. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. 
Uh, the first is what, who were the cyclists? What was that about? And the second question is, um, now I could guess, but what, what do the um, clocks represent? Okay. What, what are those? Oh yeah, doing? good point. Thank you. And, um, and on the, the theme of the second thing, I have to kind of apologize for, although it's not my fault, but <laughs> for how bad the translations were of the titles. So they were pretty awful there. There's like, fin you know, Lenin arrives at the Finland wall. What's this? <laughs> it's the Finland station, right? Okay. Anyway, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the cyclists, this is another way, a way of sort of churning, trying, like trying to drum up excitement about what's going on. Here are the factions that have come over to the Bolsheviks. <gasps> the cyclist division have come over. <gasps> okay, how exciting is that? You know, not so exciting from our perspective. But on the other hand, cyclists have neat little machinery in their cycle, so you're able to show wheels turning, and that's cool. So you, you get some um, imagery out of it, at least. The clocks, that's all this dramatic moment of this is the moment of the revolution, and here's the time in all these places around the world. So the clock, you notice, is, uh, the time is, does not seem to be standardized between, for instance, Petrograd and Moscow. Those clocks show very weird, they're off by some hour and 15 minutes, or, or something like this. And then there's clocks from all around the world, London, Paris. Why? Because this revolution is going to change the world. So we're showing uh, that effect around the world through these clocks, these different times, all beginning to spin together in the revolution. Right? And there's something there. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, he had he had this part. He had a part in Moscow in October, um, and then you know what? He kind of goes back into obscurity. So I, I, I forget what he. I actually don't remember the details of exactly everything that happens to him, but I know that people are still sort of puzzled by where he came from and who he was exactly um, later on when they're trying to write histories. Uh, Film. However, I remember the first time I went to Russia myself, I remember going, being taken to see the, um, the film studios in Leningrad. And it was extremely striking because on the walls of the film studio in Leningrad were portraits of all the people who had played Lenin. <laughs> there they were in honor, right? By then, it had become clearly an honor and not uh, something that Mayakovsky wants to throw rotten eggs at. Anybody else? Well, you know what? Speaking of clocks spinning along, I think it's time for us all to um, escape. But thanks a lot, and come back for more. <laughs>